Hello. It's a pleasure to have all of you with us today for this side event at the 48th session of the Human Rights Council on Digital Technologies and Human Rights in the Administration of Justice. My name is Peggy Hicks. I'm the Director of Thematic Engagement, Special Procedures, and Right to Development at the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. I'll be the moderator of this event today. Um, we will uh, give a little bit of time right now for people to get connected uh, and uh, just want to let you all know, I, I think you've probably been notified of this, that the event is being recorded. Uh, the general scheme of things for this event is that we are going to have uh, opening remarks from Ambassador Tichy Fisselberger, and then we will have a panel with four speakers. Following that, we hope to have plenty of time for question and answers. So uh, we're on a Zoom call, so you'll see at the bottom of your screen a Q&A box. So you can start using that, that box at any time uh, to throw in a question, and uh, we will try to go through as many of them as we can in the time remaining after the panel. So I think we've got a number of people with us, um, and we're at three minutes after. So I hope uh, we've got uh, a good quorum to, to be able to uh, begin the event. We're very grateful to have uh, the Australian, uh, Australian, Austrian ambassador. That's a mistake I've never made before, and I've always been afraid of making. So it had to happen once. We have the Austrian ambassador uh, with us, uh, well known to, to all of us here in Geneva. Uh, and her leadership on these issues, of course, has been uh, very important. But I should also, of course, say at the outset that this event is one that's co-sponsored by a number of organizations, the International Commission of Jurists, Penal Reform International, UNODC, and, and my office. Uh, but thank you to, to the Austrian mission for all of their work in pulling us together. And I'll hand the floor to Ambassador Tichy Fisselberger. Over to you. Thank you very much, Peggy. Uh, and don't worry, um, Freud uh, called this a Freudian mistake, the one you, you, you are adamant not to make. And I think he was not an Australian. Um, anyway, distinguished delegates and participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to open the side event on the use of digital technologies in the administration of justice and its repercussions on human rights. I would like to start with to thank uh, UNODC, the UN Office on Drugs and Crime in Vienna, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, yourself, Peggy, and your colleagues, as well as Penal Reform International and the International Commission of Jurists for organizing this event with us. And many thanks to you, Peggy, uh, for having accepted to be the moderator. The respect of human rights in the administration of justice, which is one of the core tasks of the state, has always been one of the pillars of our Austrian engagement in human rights within the United Nations. Because we're talking here about a part of the judiciary where the state exercises direct and immediate control over people. And therefore, the respect for the rule of law and human rights norms and standards is so crucial. We've been committed to this topic for the past 10 years in different four of the United Nations and fought to advance standards in areas such as juvenile justice, prison conditions, over-incarceration, overcrowding, or violence in prisons. Recently, we have seen a new trend in the administration of justice. And here I'm talking about the increased use of digital technologies at various stages of criminal procedures, whether it be pre-trial, during trials, or after conviction. In addition, the COVID-19 pandemic has prompted many actors in the judiciary in many countries to have increased recourse to virtual solutions involving enhanced digital technology in order to facilitate criminal justice procedures while reducing the risk of COVID transmission. These developments have the potential to significantly enhance the efficiency and the accessibility in the administration of justice, but may also carry ad adverse human rights impacts. There is a risk that the use of video conferencing technology for conducting criminal trials may infringe the rights of accused persons by effectively preventing them from presenting all the evidence relevant to their case. For example, marks of torture or other forms of ill treatment. The use of algorithms might bear the risk of perpetuating discrimination. For example, by the way, the profiling of certain groups of people is done in the investigative phase of the criminal procedures. 
it is therefore critical to discuss the human rights implications of the use of such new technologies in order to ensure that the design and implementation of digital technologies respect the human rights of persons in contact with the judiciary, including those deprived of their liberty. With today's event, Austria would like to take a first step towards a more comprehensive international approach to this topic. We have therefore gathered practitioners, experts from civil society and the relevant United Nations agencies to discuss the human rights implications in this emerging field of the justice sector, including concerns about the right to a fair trial, due process, non-discrimination, equality and equal protection before the law. I wish you all and I trust you will have an interesting discussion and a lively debate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. It's great to hear from you. Um, and, and your remarks really set the stage very well for, for what we have to discuss today. I, I think it's important when we look at this subject to really think about the fact that the potential use and therefore the implications for the use of AI and digital technologies in administration of justice take place through the full life cycle of uh, our work in the law enforcement and justice field, starting with investigations, court procedures, case administration and management um, of prisons. So it goes all the way across and, and we'll have speakers who will help us unpack some of the implications and, and various aspects of the system. Uh, I wanted to highlight before we begin that this is an area that my own office has looked at uh, recently in the context of a report issued in, in June for the by the High Commissioner to the Human Rights Council on privacy and artificial intelligence. And one of the findings in, in that report was very much around the fact that, as the High Commissioner said, the higher the risk for human rights, the stricter the legal requirements for the use of AI technology should be. And I think that's an issue that um, you know, comes into the conversation here quite a bit. And the questions of what safeguards are in place when we're in a field where people's basic freedoms are at stake um, is, is absolutely central to the discussion that we'll have. So um, as noted, the, the organizers have pulled together They're a, a wonderful group of speakers. And we're going to start off with my uh, colleague from UNODC, Valerie Lebeau. Uh, Valerie is the chief of the justice section at the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. Before leading the justice uh, section, she was the chief of the organized crime and criminal justice section, as well as secretary of the conference of the parties um, to the UN Transitional Crime Convention. We're very fortunate to have her with us today to give us an overview on the state of the use of digital technologies in the administration of justice and their increase actually during the COVID-19 pandemic. Over to you, Valerie. Thank you very much, Peggy. Excellencies, distinguished participants, dear colleagues. I would like to begin by thanking the ambassador of Austria, as well as the permanent mission of Austria to the United Nations in Geneva for this initiative in organizing this event on digital technologies and human rights in the administration of justice, as well as the co-organizers our colleagues of OHCHR, Penal Reform International, and the International Commission of Jurists. It is an, an honor for me to represent today the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime in this event, and allow me to begin by sharing a few remarks about our office. We are based in Vienna, Austria, with field offices in 121 countries around the world. The heart of our mandate is to provide technical support to member states in their implementation of international instruments relating to crime prevention and criminal justice. And there, I would like to mention in particular the United Nations standards and norms in crime prevention and criminal justice, which comprise more than 50 instruments providing technical practical guidance on how to protect and promote the human rights of people uh, in justice processes, be they victims, witnesses, suspects, accused persons, or prisoners. Today's discussion on the use of digital technologies in the administration of justice has been made highly relevant and timely in 
the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. In the field of crime prevention and criminal justice, the pandemic has deepened existing challenges and created new ones. A few examples, we have seen police being diverted from their regular duties to manage the response to the epidemiological situation, leading to an aggravation in the lack of resources dedicated to crime prevention and responses to crime. Lockdowns in many countries have led to court closures and to a backlog of cases, compromising the timely resolution of judicial proceedings, of legal proceedings. The pandemic has deepened the already long-standing global crisis of gender-based violence. In many parts of the world, domestic violence shelters have closed, social workers, trauma counselors, lawyers have lost face-to-face -face contact with their clients. So in this context, characterized by social distancing measures and lockdowns, the replacement of the existing human physical justice architecture with digital proceedings has been welcome as an expedient solution expedient economically, operationally, and administratively. However, the perceived benefits of digital justice in terms of expediency should not be prioritized over the protection of human rights and access to justice. It is important to be alert to the role of broader economic considerations and to the involvement of private business interests driving the, de the development and deployment of, te of technologies in the justice sector. There is also a risk that once technological architecture for digital justice is in place and in use, it will be difficult to return to an administration of justice that is not technologically mediated. Therefore, we should not unduly accelerate the application of technologies in justice settings until it can be demonstrated that they do not interfere with human rights and access to justice. Considering the topics that will be covered by other panelists, I will uh, uh, focus on two considerations in this discussion. The first one, it is that we need more research. We need to establish an evidence base about the effectiveness, as well as the unintended consequences of digital technologies in the administration of justice. Technical developments far outpaces efforts to study the effects of applied technology. So any move towards digitally mediated justice needs to be informed by a rigorous, inclusive and interdisciplinary research we need to determine what forms of digitized justice work, for whom and in what circumstances. Technologies continuously evolve. That's why research needs to be ongoing so that we can continuously monitor the application of technology for its unintended consequences and adverse human rights implications. Digital justice tends to obscure criminal justice processes to make this so complex that they cannot be understood by the public, by oversight bodies, and by criminal justice actors themselves. This complexity and lack of transparency complicates the exercise of oversight and the monitoring of the impacts of technology on, for instance, discrimination, due process rights, and the right to privacy. 
I would like to give two brief illustrations of this point, and I think they will be elaborated upon in later presentations. One is the use of artificial intelligence to prioritize police resources in crime prevention efforts. The processes of de decision making become completely concealed from the public, and yet the consequences of this decision making and the strategies based on them are very much felt at community level in terms of citizens in certain parts of the city being uh, experiencing um, heavy disproportionate police presence or ex experiences experiencing an increase of uh, in the use of um, police powers uh, to uh, um, arrest and search. Another example is the use of facial recognition technology for the identification of suspects and the associated risk of racial profiling, interference with privacy, and the risk inherent to the higher rate of mistakes documented to, hap to happen with these technologies. And there, I would like to note that our understanding about the possible adverse effects of these technologies are based only on our current technological knowledge. And with a long-term storage of biometric data, including facial recognition data, there is a risk that as technology continues to evolve in the future, this data may be put to other uses that we cannot anticipate at the moment and cannot mitigate. So in this sense, exercising caution now safeguards human rights in the short term, but is also essential to safeguard them in the future. The second point and last point I wanted to make is that we need to recognize a risk of deepening inequalities and discriminations. Inequality, discrimination, a lack of awareness of rights and procedures are currently heavy barriers to justice. And there is a real risk that those already marginalized will be further discriminated against and excluded by the application of digital technologies to justice settings. As one example, I would like to refer to the digital divide and the digital skills divide, which affects disproportionately women and girls as part of a broader gender-based discrimination. In some circumstances, women and girls do not have say, a safe and private access to the internet or to the home computer. And in this sort of situation, the requirement for online access as a means of gaining information of acceding to legal assistance or of engaging in legal proceedings will close pathways to justice for women and girls, in particular when they are faced with domestic violence. Indeed, uh, we uh, should be aware that technology and patterns of technology use are not gender neutral. And digitally mediated justice is not an assurance of increased access to justice. So uh, to conclude, I would like to say that the idea that the digital technology can assist in increasing access to justice does seem compelling in the current context, uh, uh, just uh, having experienced this pandemic. Uh, but it is important that we recognize that technology will not automatically address existing challenges, and that, in fact, it may very well replicate them or even exacerbate them. That's why before we fully embrace the use of various technologies in the administration of justice, rigorous research is required to fully understand the geographic, socio-economic, so, socio racial, gender, and intergenerational implications of this use of technology 
and to ensure that all and any use of technology is in full observance of international legal obligations and core human rights principles. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Valeria. You've really gotten us off to a wonderful start and I'm sure have provoked a lot of deep thinking on the part of, of those listening. Um, a couple of the points that you made that really resonated with me is uh, in terms of this, this issue of the need for research and for greater transparency to, to combat the complexity and opaqueness of these technologies, I've often heard the point made about the pace at which these developments are happening, outstripping um, our ability to keep up with it. But you also emphasize that the length of which some of this data and, and technology will be in place um, as, as another challenge too, a different temporal context to it, which I thought was very interesting. And your point as well about the, the impacts um, for discrimination and inequality and exacerbating those already, you know, very troubling issues within our societies, I think is so well taken. Uh, we also talk, we often talk about these being risks that we see, but as your example shows, those risks are actually a reality. They're being confronted day by day by women who are on the other side of the digital divide, as you pointed out, by people who are suffering from racial discrimination and are, are impacted by technologies in a different way. So those risks are realities that we need to deal with. Somebody who knows a lot about how that's playing out in practice is our next speaker, Triona Lenahan. Uh, Triona, we're happy to have you with us. Uh, Triona is the Policy and International Advocacy Manager of Penal Reform International. For the last seven years, PRI has been monitoring the role and use of technologies in prisons around the world as part of its Global Prison Trends Program. Today, Triona is going to share with us some of the findings on the growing uses of digital technologies in prisons for security, rehabilitation, and contact with the outside world, including the rapid expansion of their use during the COVID-19 pandemic and some of the key human rights considerations that that implies. Over to you, Triona. Thanks, Peggy, um, and thanks to all our colleagues at the Austrian Mission and all the co-sponsoring organizations for bringing us all together today uh, to discuss this really important issue. Um, we heard already in the ambassador's opening remarks that there's a really huge range of areas where we're seeing digital technologies being trialed and implemented across criminal justice systems. Um, over recent years, we've seen technological innovation providing real opportunities for improving the efficient functioning of prisons and criminal justice systems with everything from electronic and cloud-based file management systems that link up different services to online education and, and remote uh, health services being more and more common in some regions. Um, a lot of these uses come with their own challenges and human rights considerations, but I'm sure I could be here all day if I tried to go through all of them. So as Peggy mentioned, I'll focus specifically on the use of digital technologies that we've seen in prisons um, in some key areas relating to security, rehabilitation and contact with the outside world. Many of the primary functions of digital technologies in places of detention, especially artificial intelligence or AI led systems are related to security. Um, and they usually are aimed at enhancing security or surveillance uh, and minimizing staff time or easing the burden on staff. Uh, we've seen AI used in some prisons, for example, to monitor phone calls. Um, those systems are used in several states in the US and they use uh, speech recognition and machine learning software to build databases of searchable words and patterns to detect uh, possible illegal activity. Unmanned drones are also um, increasingly being trialed and used, um, and they've been used in a number of countries to patrol inside and outside prisons to monitor people's movements. Um, on the other hand, drones have also been a security threat to prisons. Uh, they've been used to drop contraband inside prison walls in some places. Uh, so in response to that, um, the UK, for example, is trialing the use of another device that can detect and deflect the packages that are dropped. Uh, autonomous vehicles are also um, becoming more popular. Uh, one has been tested in a prison in Australia to parole the perimeter, um, and that essentially would replace the work of two prison officers who would check the perimeter three times a day. So a significant saving 
uh, in staff time potentially. Uh, the vehicle is equipped with all sorts of um, uh, high definition cameras, night vision um, and incident alert technology and also a two way intercom for a communication exchange. And it can potentially be uh, integrated with airborne drones as well. Um, robotic guards are another area where we've seen use for some time now. Um, they were introduced in South Korea as far back as 2012, um, but some more recent trials in Hong Kong have also seen robotic guards equipped with cameras and microphones uh, to allow um, staff and people in prison to speak to each other remotely. And we're also now seeing new systems being used which more constantly monitor the behavior of people in prison um, and have the ability to alert staff to activity that the system registers as abnormal or suspicious. Um, and these usually involve uh, either hidden cameras or sensors in cells, which use video analytics um, to detect changes in behavior or movements or they could involve wearable devices as well, like wristbands, which, uh, which measure heart rates of the wearer. Um, and more recently, we're seeing the development of smart prisons in some countries, and smart prisons tend to bring a lot of these technologies together in one place. And um, so earlier this year in May, uh, Hong Kong launched its first smart prison, which uses four major systems, one being a security and monitoring system, which involves biometric technology, facial recognition, and video analytic monitoring uh, in cell to detect changes in behavior and send alerts to staff, and then integrates that with uh, drones and robotic guards as well for patrolling the prison. Um, in terms of rehabilitation then, um, a lot of the provision of rehabilitation and reintegration programs for people in prison uh, varies massively between countries, uh, usually due to funding and, and resources. In prisons in high income countries, there's been a rise in access to online education and training in recent years, and this has really expanded uh, during the pandemic. A lot of prisons now um, where they have the infrastructure in place, provide uh, in-cell laptops or computers for self-paced learning. Um, in New Zealand, for example, all prisons now have secure computer suites that allow limited uh, access to online for education and, and training purposes. Um, and virtual reality or VR is now also being introduced in Colorado in the US. Uh, we saw a program where VR is used for people who were convicted when they were children and have spent uh, at least 20 years in prison. Um, and the VR, the virtual environment that's created is designed to help them to um, prepare for release uh, in the two or three years before so that they can get used to some very um, basic tasks to you and I, like uh, using a bank card or doing shopping or laundry, things like that. Um, so during the pandemic, uh, prisons with online access and that have the infrastructure to support these sort of programs have been far better placed to respond to the, the impact of the restrictions we've seen brought in, which really impacted the delivery of rehabilitation programs. So many training and work activities have been suspended, uh, often for really long times, but where there was access to digital technology, Programs could be adapted to online solutions or new programs could be put in place. And some prisons collaborated with universities to offer online access to courses, which has been a really positive development um, and is expected to be maintained in some places after the pandemic. Um, finally, in relation to rehabilitation, um, the sort of current world we live in or the current job market that people leaving prisons may be entering. Um, digital literacy is really required at least at a basic level for so many jobs and even for daily life. So we found that excluding people in prison from the digital world increasingly results in a sort of systematic denial of opportunities to learn or to gain employment. And that really exacerbates their social exclusion and impairs their prospects for reintegration following release. 
So to overcome that challenge, there have been increased efforts in some countries to train people in detention for employment in the tech sector. Um, we've seen a, a program called Change Hub in Kenya, which is a technology focused rehabilitation program, which has given women in prison lessons in coding, web design and computer repair. Um, and in the US, uh, Justice Through Code is another initiative uh, which involves a sort of semester long coding intensive and also a range of uh, interpersonal skills training and networking opportunities. Um, finally, then in relation to contact with the outside world, um, facilitating contact between people in prison and the outside world through online communications like video calls has been increasingly common over recent years, even before the pandemic. Um, but I guess before the pandemic, the implementation was a lot more piecemeal and it was quite slowly expanding in most places. Um, it was generally used to supplement in-person visits, for example, in places where maybe visits are restricted to close family members and therefore, you know, video calls could be used for um, a broader range of, of contact with um, other family members or friends. But since the beginning of the pandemic, it's really expanded a lot more rapidly. Um, many prisons have implemented video calling for the first time or expanded its use significantly um, when the prison visits were suspended or restricted. But there have been really significant variances across countries and prisons within countries um, in terms of the speed of the rollout, also whether it's available in all prisons, um, whether it's free of charge or not and whether its use is limited in any way, either in terms of the frequency or the length of the calls. And so in that way, we can see um, you know, certain categories, perhaps, of people in prison being discriminated against if they're in smaller prisons or remote, more remote areas where some of the responses focus on the main or the larger prisons. Uh, virtual platforms have also been used for remote healthcare provision in prisons, um, and that's really expanded a lot uh, during the pandemic, and I guess it's also expanding in some countries in the community as well. Um, and they've also been used in many, um, by many prison monitoring bodies as an alternative way to implement their mandate where access to prison has been restricted during the pandemic. So just to think of some of the key human rights concerns that we see across all of these areas, then uh, security, rehabilitation and contact with the outside world, all of these tools can be really effective in making prisons more secure and easing the burden on staff, but they really come at a huge cost of reducing human interaction with people in prison. Um, and that's such a crucial factor to rehabilitation and to ensuring the needs of people supervised by staff are understood and that they're met effectively. Um, it's been mentioned already around the threat to the right to privacy, um, which a person does not lose uh, when they enter prison. Surveillance technology in prisons is very well established, um, but artificial intelligence tools take that level of monitoring and surveillance to a sort of another level. Um, and so it really requires a, a clear and robust legal framework to be in place that protects the rights of people in prison, particularly where systems are planned that use this more constant um, recording and processing of data on people's movements or behaviour, and to ensure that any measures introduced are in line with the principles of proportionality, legality and necessity. There can also be concerns around involvement of the private sector um, and large tech companies. Um, and just to reiterate Valerie's point as well around the digital divide, all of the technologies I've mentioned today are of course not available in every country or in every region. Uh, many prison systems have limited or no access to the internet, which most of these tools rely on, um, or access to the funding required to develop or implement them. Um, during the pandemic, the increased reliance on tech solutions to mitigate the impacts of restrictive regimes has really deepened the digital divide. We've seen, you know, in places where prison systems are better resourced, it may have been easier to uh, increase bandwidth or purchase new equipment, but a lack of infrastructure or resources in many countries has meant that people in prison uh, couldn't benefit from any of these technologies and are left even further behind then. 
So in an effort to end on a positive note, which I'm not always good at doing, uh, I would say that you know, the advances in digital technology in prisons do provide uh, much cause for optimism, particularly in terms of rehabilitation opportunities and uh, prison management, if they're designed and implemented with the rights of people in prison at their core. Um, technologies can make prisons a safer environment for staff, as well as for people detained or visiting prisons. Um, things like digital file management or uh, cameras, you know, body worn cameras can also help to prevent human rights violations and increase accountability. Uh, but with all of the, the caveats we've mentioned today. So I'll leave it there. I'm sure I've gone way over time. So apologies for that, Peggy. Uh, but I'll look forward to more discussion later. That's okay, Triano. Thank you. I, I found it very fascinating because we often, within the field of, of speaking about digital technologies, we always talk about the double edged sword, the opportunities and the challenges. And listening to you speak, it was just so apparent how the prison environment just encapsulates that uh, that scenario of some ways in which it could really improve things for people, but just the enormous risks there are to the misuse of these technologies if, if they're not uh, handled in the right way. And then also, as you said, the digital divide, it's, it's hard to, to listen to, to all of that about what's happening in some places and not think about all the places across the globe where this isn't, uh, isn't at all applicable and, and could be an, uh, useful in different ways. But we'll move directly on to our next feature, speaker. We're very fortunate to have with us Judge Ramila Dragacevic Dicic, uh, who is currently a justice of the Supreme Court of Serbia and vice president of the ICJ. We're so fortunate to have you with us, Judge. We know you've had a distinguished career uh, within uh, Serbia, where you began as a, um, you've been a judge of the Supreme Court since 2013, but you also were a district judge starting um, much earlier in 1994 and uh, became part of the uh, judges uh, who established the Association um, of Judges of Serbia, um, but then went uh, under the government of Slobodan, uh, Slobodan Milosevic, had, had some difficulties uh, around dismissal of judges and during that period, um, but was able to retake your post uh, following the annulment of, of that uh, decision at the elections in uh, 2000 by the parliament. Uh, where 15 judges regained their positions, including you, to the Belgrade District Court. And following that, you acted as a special chamber uh, for the organized crime of the Belgrade District Court and um, became prominent in that capacity, sitting on a number of high profile cases. So we're very fortunate to have you with us and we're looking forward to hearing from you specifically about the use of virtual technologies in courts and their impact on fair trial rights. Over to you, Justice. Okay. Thank you. I'm trying to see what the time is to be in time frame. Greetings from me from Serbia as a judge and greetings from me as the vice president of the International Commission of Jurists. And we are happy to be with you as co-organizer. And, and I can see as I was informed, there are lots of people listening at us and I think it will be a valuable conference. I will try to speak as a judge with the practical issues that we somehow confronted here in Serbia and also all over the world. And for the beginning, I would like also to, to suggest to you to see on web that ICJ issued a publication which is called Video Conferencing Courts and COVID-19 Recommendations Based on International Standards. It's a short and good one issued in November 2020, and I think has a lot of answers on things that we are talking today. It looks like this, okay? And now I will just, I will just uh, start saying that uh, mainly this uh, issue that we are talking today about is connected with criminal trials and criminal, criminal, criminal courts and also with the position of the same people that my colleague before me was talking about. And as it, we could see it in Serbia and globally, it can be, two, there are two possibilities. Sometimes virtual justice is prescribed by the law, by criminal procedure law, which is in all of our laws for the certain situations, especially connected with the protected witness. And that's something that we all have, but is strictly has to be prescribed by the law and respected on the, on the level of legality of the proofs that are collected on that, on, on that way. 
Then we have another situation that we are facing now, unfortunately, for such a long time is virtual justice in the state of emergency. In this situation, it's because of COVID-19. So in Serbia, we had, there is differences. I won't talk about that now, about the state of emergency and the emergency situation which all we have in our medical laws or whatever. But in Serbia, for two months, from March 2020, 2020 till the May 2020, we had a state of emergency. And what was somehow specific for our country, and I think some others around the world, that is that executives somehow gave themselves the power to bring some decrees, considering how the trials should be held. So first, Ministry of Justice gave some recommendation to the judges and the prosecutors to go with the video conferences and so-called virtual trials. And after that, the government issued a decree saying that uh, certain trials, and there were numbered, those are the trials that are of high, of high importance, where the people are detained, violation, uh, some violation of human rights, and also the crime against public health should be held virtually. And from that moment, the judges, association of judges, associations of prosecutors, and um, some professors, we opposed to that. And High Judicial Council, that really has the power to do it, issued its own recommendation, really numbering just the, the cases of high importance that I mentioned, and the cases, again, the public health, that can be done with the virtual trials, with video conferences, but only with the consent of judge, with the decision of judge and the consent of the defense. So that was our reaction and somehow we reacted on that. And when the, the state of emergency was ended, this decree was ended also. So now we have the question because now the whole community, international community is now trying to develop this video conferencing to use it more and more. And me as a judge, I really think that there are a lot of dangerous issues there that we have to take care about. And I think, and that will be my final recommendation that it's really a great responsibility on judges first to decide in each case, whether it will be like virtual video conferences and to take all the measurements of the court proportion measurements to and safeguards for right to fair trial. First, what we are facing is that, uh, yeah, I just, I just uh, forgot to tell you that there were about 70 trials that were held in Serbia during this state of emergency. And on some trials, uh, lawyers, which was good, I think, refused to come to the trial. And some trials, then the main problem was that the defendant, that the accused person was in a detention and he was like on the video and the trial was in the courtroom and the defendant lawyer was in the courtroom. So it was impossible for two of them to really meet in privacy. So that was the reason that the lawyers refused to come and those trials were just, they, they, did not, they were not held. So it was good. And some of those trials, I think, will come to the Supreme Court of Serbia under the issue of legality of those trials. We didn't still have those cases, so I cannot really report on that. When we talk about video conferencing and using all the digital techniques and digital measurements that we have, I think that uh, there are a few things that we have to take care about and two things, few things that can be really abused. This is the first one for me is the principle of directness of the trial, which is prescribed in all criminal procedures laws, I think all over the world, world which means that the accused person has to be present in the courtroom. And there are only exceptions that are also prescribed by the law, if it's in absentia, some laws don't have it. So it is really very important. And then, it's the issue of publicity of hearings. And on this video conferences, public is usually excluded. 
So it's just a video conference between the parties. So we don't have the publicity of the trial, which is of the high importance, and it can, can be excluded only under certain circumstances. And the health issue, like a COVID, is not really the ground that the publicity can be excluded. So that's something that European Court I have some has some cases about that, and you can see the, you can see it in ICJ pub publication. Then the main thing is the right to effective defense of the accused person, especially if it is the same person. And my colleague was, was talking about the situation in detention premises and, and it's okay with all the digital measurements and whatever, but I think it's really problematic how to have confidential talk with lawyers under those conditions. If it's all under the, I don't know, surveillance, or if it's like a video, how can we really provide this principle of confidential talk with the lawyers? And that's all really on the judge. Judge has to take care about that. And even, especially, I don't know, you cannot, you cannot just ask a accused person, oh, did you have confidential talk? And he will maybe say yes or maybe no, and then the lawyer. Judge has to really check it and to really be sure that it was like that and the accused person had the time, premises, and confidential talk with his defendant lawyer. Then there's also a principle of contradictory examination on the trial, which means that the accused person has the right to question directly the witnesses against him, his witness, and the witness of the other party. And that's really the principle that is highly valuable by European Court of Human Rights. And we have a very rich practice of European Court of Human Rights when it's really the situation when you don't hear the witness in front of the court directly and when the accused person cannot directly question him. Then I think the big problem is problem with the possible torture and the human treatment of the detained person as a cured person, because sometimes I, I'm sure, I, I, I didn't see the case, but I'm sure that will be the cases and there are the cases that the same person being the detention premises is not really free to talk about some torture and human treatment because it can be heard. And how, and even if it's not like that, he's afraid because he doesn't have the guarantees that it's like that. And sometimes there are some injuries on the body that can be shown that should be seen only by the judge, something that will bring suspicion to the judge. So this principle of directness is so, so important. And it's all somehow said in the International Convention of Civil and Political Rights. I think it's Article 14 and European Convention on Human Rights, it's Article 6. So that's, that's why it is so important to think about all those problems and that's such a big responsibility on the judge. And I'm talking mainly on the first instant trial. There's not a problem when we come to the second instant trial when it's not so important, this principle of directness, but the first instant trial, I think that that can be very, very problematic. And I think under International Convention of Civil and Political Rights, it's strictly said that somehow this presence of the accused person in the, on the trial. European Convention doesn't talk about that so directly, but the practice of European courts stress the importance of that. So I think that uh, for the beginning, I think that we should somehow agree on that, that for the video conferencing, conferencing, we should have the consent of the accused person. Then we have the problem when the accused person defendant doesn't have a lawyer, because there are some cases that can be without lawyer by, at, at our law and all the others, I think. So then we have to be sure that the accused person is well informed about the right and the consequences of some possible video conference. Then there's a problem some of my colleagues before mentioned, the problem of privacy. And I think 
and also the privacy of the judge, you know, somehow uh, by the our law, if someone, if uh, we have to do the, if we want to video tape, to video, I don't know how to say the trial, that was on the few trials that I was sitting on, the big kind of top crime, the murder of our political leaders. And so we were asked personally, do we agree that it is videotaped and that it can be then put on the TV or whatever? And then we have to ask a few persons. So, so I think that's the issue of privacy, but also the issue of possible leak of data. You know, how shall we protect the data of accused persons, his whatever private life and the data of the judges or assembly? So there are some issues that uh, that are to be considered, and I think that uh, that uh, the derogation that the judge the judge has to be aware that derogation of all those rights should be somehow proportional with the respect of human rights, with the derogation of human rights. Somehow that judge should do very good assessment on all of that. And I think that it, it could never be imposed on the judge that he has to do with our conference if he really thinks that it is not fair trial and this is not good for his case. So I think it should be left for the judge. I think I will stop now and then be ready to answer the question. I just, it was a quick mentioning all the issues that can be recognized in our court practice. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you very much, Judge. I think you've done an excellent job of really giving us sort of the, the point by point uh, look at all of the problems that arise when one tries to do uh, criminal justice and, and particularly criminal proceedings in a, in a way that involves digital technologies. Um, and you know your your understanding of the role of the judge, I think, is is really important to to seeing it from that perspective. And you really made me think as well about sort of the equality of arms, the fact that um, you know how a defendant in in prison will be in a much different position than they would be in the courtroom next to their lawyer, which is a a very visible way of of seeing how how this could impact on on a fair trial proceeding. Um, we're going to turn uh, directly to our next speaker, um, who is uh, Sarah Chandler, who's a senior policy advisor at uh, our wonderful organization doing excellent work in this field, European Digital Rights. Uh, she's going to look with us at uh, algorithms and criminal justice. Um, and EDRI is a, a network of 45 digital and human rights organizations working across Europe. And Sarah there leads their work on AI including the civil society response to the EU's Artificial Intelligence Act, as well as leading their work on digital discrimination. Um, she's gonna give us a sense today by outlining the vast fundamental human rights implications on the use of AI in criminal justice system, and some of the reflections on how um, this is all playing out in the EU space with some recommendations of how we can avoid harmful use of AI in the criminal justice system. Over to you, Sarah, thank you. Thank you so much. And I can only reiterate what my uh, co-panelists have said, which is thanks so much for this wonderful event, wonderful moderation. And really, I think it's very important that we have more and more uh, conversations like this. They'll become more and more relevant um, as time goes on. So I'm very happy that we're here today to discuss it. Um, I would like to give uh, an intervention which will focus about um, some examples of AI systems used in the criminal justice system, particularly in Europe. Um, I'll give the caveat that, that much of my work is in the European sphere. And so many of my examples and case studies will be taken from the European context, um, both in a criminal justice uh, setting, but also broadly in policing. I'll, I will look at some examples in that context. I'll give some reflections on the fundamental rights implications of some of these use cases, but also then I'd like to speak to a few recommendations that Edry have put forward uh, with respect to this um, ongoing EU process, legislative process, um, otherwise called the Artificial Intelligence Act. Um, and for those that haven't seen that, it's a very interesting exercise in really the first regulatory exercise to um, 
regulate a, a general purpose technology like AI. Um, a proposal was launched in April of this year, and, and many of my thoughts um, are really uh, about the regulation of AI systems, particularly in the criminal justice, um, reflect also that ongoing process. So I'll give some um, reflections on that. Um, so firstly, we of course don't have the time in this event to talk about all the different use cases of um, AI in the criminal justice system that we're seeing used. Some have already been mentioned by uh, my co-panelists, but I think some that are particularly striking to me, um, I, I will talk about two sort of areas that we'll see them used in. So particularly, um, we're seeing a number of, in the European context, uh, risk assessment tools used in the criminal justice space. Um, we see that particularly uh, AI systems are being used to inform charging decisions. Um, particularly those systems are designed to attempt to assess uh, a person's risk of reoffending, often using burial roles that relate to the socioeconomic background of the suspect, criminal history of the suspect, and also various other variables, depending on the case study that we look at. Um, in some cases, you see that these uh, the decisions that are generated by these systems are used by police to make decisions related to charging or other non-punitive uh, interventions. And we'll see a number of cases where there'll be a, a track system where the, the, the result of the what the algorithm generates will decide whether the case um, pursues into the traditional criminal justice system or if it goes to other methods like rehabilitation. Um, many of these cases I think are concerning, um, particularly insofar as they make punitive decisions without following traditional processes to determine innocence or guilt. And so therefore very have very sort of relevant consequences for liberty, for other, other fundamental rights, and just in general for the, 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 the right to be presumed innocent and to be, to be judged by your peers. In this case, we're judged by algorithms. And, and this is of course problematic for many, many other reasons um, as many of my colleagues have already explained. Um, many of these systems also relate to uh, ongoing developments in the US, um, which are also risk assessment tools, the most famous one, of course, being the compass tool, but risk assessment at the point of sentencing. Um, all, all those such systems used in the pretrial phase also uh, pose a number of considerations. They, they make decisions around whether a defendant should be released on bail, or, um, or um, decisions relating to sentencing. And there've been a number of studies to show incidents of racial bias in those decisions and other um, more broad privacy concerns, um, as well as consequences for the presumption of innocence. The second broad type of case study that we, we, we look at very much at EDRI are um, the use of systems at the investigative stage. So predictive policing or other systems that use to uh, assess the risk of future criminality, even if there has been no uh, criminal conduct in the past. So here we see a number of, um, when I use the term predictive policing, it, it's really an umbrella term to explore um, the uses of predictive modeling uh, systems to forecast either where or by whom certain types of crimes are likely to co be committed. Often such systems are repeatedly scoring individuals and particularly poor people, working class people, racialized migrant communities with a higher likelihood of presumed future criminality. So we've seen in some cases attempts to predict particularly whether children are at risk of criminality in some member in EU, some EU member states. Um, and in those cases, you see information um, as variant as factors relating to school attendance, other social information about the areas such children live in, behavior of family members, or whether they've been a victim or a witness to a crime. Information like these deciding actually, is a, is a child likely to commit a crime in, in the future? What is the future criminality of this, this individual? Um, the organization Fair Trials have done an interesting study of up to some of these um, cases. And what we, we have seen in the cases that they've used, particularly on children, is that they are such systems are often, the, and I'm quoting now, the first step in a pipeline 
of automated risk assessments, which can lead to serious criminal justice penalties and other related outcomes in the future. So I think it's also important when we're looking at certain predictive policing systems or other deployments of AI, is to look at the ecosystem in which they're deployed, right? Rather than the just the particular use case, is what are the consequences beyond the decision that is taken? Um, and often that is part of really a complex matrix of social uh, outcomes, decisions, and how the algorithm feeds into that can often have really uh, vast negative consequences, sometimes much beyond the gravity of the actual decision that we're in question uh, stemming from the AI system. As has already been, been mentioned, there is a question around racial profiling with these, um, with such systems, particularly such systems that relate to crime mapping. So not just a, there, there are AI systems that look to pr predict risk in terms of types of individuals or certain individuals. And then there are other predictive policing systems which look to assess the likelihood of risk in particular areas of, of a locality. Um, place-based crime, uh, predictive policing systems, crime mapping systems, that many different terms describe how they are. But in, a, in essence, these systems use a broad range of data sources to try to make either profiles of offenders or uh, make predictions as to where crime will happen in the future. It's been pointed out by many people that often the crimes that are in question are very uh, specifically chosen. They often relate to crimes that we normally associate with poor people or racialized communities, as opposed to white color crimes. But there's also the deeper question there about how such systems are based on past criminal activity. Therefore, they relate to who is policed rather than who often actually commits crime. And actually, when we look at um, often map uh, the way predicting policing systems work, often they are more likely to predict um, future criminality amongst racialized communities, working class communities, and often that doesn't really correspond to crime rates for those particular crimes. So we see this imbalance. So these are just two, two of the broad types of um, uses of AI that we're seeing and, and we're studying in the criminal justice system. A few reflections on those and the fundamental rights implications. Firstly, and I think this has been mentioned already, but it's important to emphasize is that we also see with these systems is that they, with their introduction, we see the expansion of the criminal sphere. So not are we criminalizing things that are previously outside or not criminal. So for example, we are entering data into the criminal justice system about school attendance and other social types of behavior. But we're also criminalizing behavior that has not yet happened. Um, which I think is perhaps overlooked in some of the predictive policing discourse, is that when we start to deem relevant to uh, the algorithmic decision-making uh, conduct, such as are, are, the, are the group in question single mothers? Is the child in question having certain school attendance? What we're actually saying is that such uh, information is relevant to criminal conduct and future criminal conduct is a rife area for discrimination and is really a, ha, will have vast implications on the presumption of innocence in the future. The other consideration that I think is really important um, is, of course, the, the notion of embedding discrimination, existing historic patterns of structural discrimination, and particularly uh, a number of uh, academics that have looked into predictive policing system have emphasized how, how far they exacerbate this um, codified way to enforce the, the link between racialization and risk. Um, particularly when we look at the locational systems, we see that they use what is so-called like neutral factors such as postcode, but that in, in essence such factors serve as a proxy for race or for class and other pro protected characteristics. And then as a result, uh, the data used, the outcomes generated, often exacerbate sort of histories of over-policing of certain communities. Um, and what we, we are concerned with is such systems because of their technical uh, semblance potentially afford a false objectivity to patterns of racial profiling. Um, also uh, beside race, we also see that fundamentally many of these systems target people who are poor or working class. So again, coming back to linking uh, certain social economic behavior with crime, such as 
uh, being a school single mother, being um, having low school attendance or living in a certain area. And we all know where you live hugely determines how much police attention you are subject to. The other concern I think um, is, is quite an important one is the difficulty at which uh, the introduction of such systems poses to the, the um, accessibility of justice for being harmed by these systems. So often we know that um, if you're harmed by an AI system, it's very uh, ephemeral, it's very hard to predict. We often even don't know when those systems are being used and therefore, of course, more difficult to challenge. And so something we've been playing with is, is the notion is, is actually, do these systems create further distance from justice? Particularly also looking at the app, the, the ongoing absence of effective remedies po po proposed in, in an ongoing EU, um, EU, but also a European and I'm sure international attempts to regulate AI systems is that many of them do not include an effective remedy for when um, an individual or a collective has been harmed by an AI system. And then lastly, I think one, one uh, particular concern is the question of privatization. So the criminal justice sphere is the, the public sphere. We have to explore the link between the creation and the development of AI systems, who creates and develops those systems, which are often private service, service providers, and what that means when we contract out public services to those private service providers. Um, often this creates this ongoing cycle of de dependence on those service providers for what are pu essentially public functions. Uh, but also I think that they create a further distance um, from democracy um, once a, a private company is essentially very responsible for a particular element of a public function like policing or like sentencing. Actually, what we then um, create is um, more opacity and further distance and further um, difficulty for people to challenge that because it no longer becomes performed by an agent of the state. Uh, but the function is, is in essence uh, carried out by private actors. So these, uh, these are the, some of the very many uh, sort of concerns we have with the introduction of, of some AI systems into the, into, into the um, criminal justice space. I'll really be brief with some about my recommendations because I'm running out of time. The, the first is that we really believe that um, any regulatory attempt looking to govern this needs to set the parameters for what are the unacceptable uses of AI systems in the criminal justice sphere. So uh, the recent report that Peggy mentioned at the beginning was a, a really interesting um, articulation of this. Uh, one particular line I found was interesting was that uses of AI which inherently conflict with the prohibition of discrimination should not be allowed. And this um, really sets up nicely what um, much of their work of Edry have been doing is to set the red lines around harmful uses of AI. It is not that any AI system can simply be improved by better data or debiasing techniques. Actually, many uses of AI are inherently problematic, inherently pose a risk to fundamental rights, like many of the ones that I've um, explored. We have called in the EU context for a prohibition on the uses of AI in the field of law enforcement that purport to predict future behavior, including uh, analyzing the risk that in individuals will offend or reoffend, or predicting uh, the likelihood that criminal or unfavorable conduct will occur on the basis of personality traits, individual or group characteristics or location. And this has been picked up uh, to some extent in many uh, EU reports. There are many other uses of AI that we also think that should be prohibited, particularly, in a, as was already mentioned by Valerie, um, the use of remote biometric identification in publicly accessible places, um, but also less uh, dis discussed in this context, but also uh, emotion recognition. So for example, some systems that purport to detect uh, the aggression of certain people um, deployed in the public space, uh, which often when linked with predictive policing systems, not only uh, amount to mass surveillance in many cases, but also have really vast uh, implications for privacy of other already um, policed uh, communities. And particularly if we think about our stereotypes of who is most likely often to be suspicious or aggressive, uh, it's very much likely that the AI systems that are designed to detect such aggression are also likely to perpetuate those racial biases. Um, the second recomm recommendation I can bring is that actually many uh, attempts to regulate AI um, seek to regulate the development of those systems. So the private companies that development 
develop those systems, the, the attempt to put a set of technical standards on how those AI systems are developed. While this is very important, we also cannot miss the other side of the puzzle, which is that we also need to regulate the use of these systems. So in the context of the criminal justice, if a police uh, authority is attempting to introduce an AI system for any particular purpose in the public sphere, we need to also have regulation about what they need to do before they can actually introduce those systems, what factors they need to consider, what factors they need to prove and how they actually assess what will the likelihood impact be on the fundamental rights of the people that are actually affected by those systems. This is um, captured in many other uh, contexts by many others who are looking into mandatory human rights impact assessments. And we agree um, with the need to actually put uh, obligations to conduct those impact assessments on um, entities like police forces that are looking to deploy the systems, similar systems to ones I've outlined today. The last one is uh, the, the, the next uh, recommendation is full public transparency. So individual civil society in order to know their rights and to know that they're how they're impacted by AI systems need to have some way that they can access information about what AI systems are used and how they might affect them. So in the EU space, there is something called uh, there's something proposed called the European AI database. Currently in this in the AI system, this is not actually proposed that information about what AI system is in use will be recorded in that system, but we think it should be. And then lastly, of course, and, and the uh, probably very relevant to the audience here today is the need to have effective remedies. So including in any new AI regulation, the capacity for individuals or for, collect or for, or for collectives to bring a case uh, to a court to demonstrate that they have been uh, harmed by a particular AI system. Um, another interesting uh, recommendation could be also to um, have a capacity that individuals might flag for national investigation, uh, some harmful use cases that might violate uh, fundamental rights. This is another um, proposal that we're, we're putting forward in the EU space, but we could easily see it replicated in other uh, jurisdictional contexts, and, and we think it's important. Uh, to empower individuals, communities, and otherwise other people affected by these systems. Um, and to, in essence, reduce that distance from justice that we're seeing uh, being generated when we increasingly use uh, AI systems in the criminal justice space. Uh, so that, with that, I'll leave. Um, and thank you very much um, for listening me, to me today. And I'm really happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Sarah. I think you've done an excellent job of really setting forward um, some of the, the really tough, tough challenges that we face in this, this area and the, and the real life impacts um, of using uh, AI in, in settings where there is not transparency and remedy and, and the red lines that, that you've called for. Um, there was a comment in the, in the chat box about shades of minority report from Adolfo of ICJ. Um, and I think many of us feel that way when, when we hear about the way that it's being used. But of course, that, that was a tale of, of, of horror, basically, in terms of the ultimate impact that, that un, untethered use of technology can have. And unfortunately, I think there is a, a, real, a real concern here that we've, again, and I think it was Valerie started us with this, the idea that um, the developments have outpaced the, the guardrails that we need uh, in place to, to uh, respond to them. We have um, several good questions in the, in the Q&A and we wanna to turn to them quickly so that we have a chance to open up this discussion a bit. Um, the first one uh, was for Judge uh, Dragocevich uh, Dicic and I, I realize you've already responded in part to the, to the question flag there, but thought, thought I'd give you a chance to expand on it. Um, Ali Marat Nas has asked her about uh, judges in criminal adjudications benefiting from nonverbal clues in the process of evidence assessment and wanted to know a bit of, of what she thought about the actual or potential impacts that digital technologies may render on judgecraft, how, how judges might actually use some of this going forward. Over to you. Me? Yes, please. Okay, okay. I, I already answered my answer will be short that if we talk of nonverbal written proofs, it can be really be something be a burden for the trial. There are many, and I think the digital technologies can really improve that part of the trial and that's what we are also doing in Serbia the way you somehow bring them in front of parties and you give them digitally they read it and then they discuss about it and it shortens a trial a lot so I just 
don't see any objections from my side to, to that good use of digital technologies when those evidence are in question. Thank you. Great, thank you. Now there are definitely some useful applications. I think um, they were also though asking and, I, and um, the last speaker, Sarah, uh, raised this issue about this whole idea of emotion recognition and, and credibility of witnesses and use of digital technologies that may either try to you know, help judges to identify who's telling the truth and who isn't or what their emotions are or whether they're aggressive. Um, obviously, uh, you know, part of what our office has said in the report that's been referenced is that there is quite a bit of evidence that that technology isn't, isn't ripe yet. Uh, it doesn't have the ability to do what it purports to do. Uh, but just wanted to get a sense from your standpoint of whether um, uh, there is any potential uses in that realm, or um, I think it goes to your points as well, that if the defendant isn't in the courtroom and can't see the witnesses and you can't see the defendant as a judge, that that might interfere with your ability uh, to, to look to the veracity of, of testimony and other things. What do you think? It's for me also? Yes, please. Okay, okay. Is it connected with the first question? Yes, I mean, I think just they, they'd asked sort of about nonverbal. Um, okay, then maybe I misunderstood when I, when I, when they uh -huh. said nonverbal, I thought about the written evidence and something like that. I'm, I may be the one that misunderstood, but it's a, a two part question now. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay. For sure, I think that you are right. And I agree that it can be the problem because this directness of the trial, that's what I was talking about. When you question the witness, judge has to see him in present to see. Sometimes it's really important for the judge, you know, the, the color of the face, the way that someone is standing and the body language, something that you cannot really see with use of those techniques. And also we have this cross crossing of the witnesses and crossing of the defendant and the witness, which might be really important for the trial. And I think that also I agree that it can be misused and that's something that is something to avoid. And when we talk about witness protections, that's different issues. We have it in the laws, you know, that you have you can you cannot see the witness or you can videotape the witness statement and then look look at the look that at the trial without bringing the witness in front of the court. And that is strictly prescribed by the law. And the only purpose is to protect the rights and the life and security of the witness. And it's also on the judge to decide whether it is then fair not to have that witness in the trial, on the trial, and to be questioned by defendant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. I think that's really helpful to, to get those additional comments. Um, we also have a question from Lola Sanchez Arcos uh, with Children uh, Child Rights Connect, who's really talked about the, the extent that digital technology can afford new opportunities in children's rights and fundamental in enhancing access to justice for both adults and children. Um, and uh, she also comments on the Committee on the Rights of the Child, noting recently that states' parties should provide children with child-sensitive and age-appropriate information in child-friendly language on their rights and, uh, and on reporting complaint mechanisms, services, and remedies available uh, in cases where their rights in relation to the digital environment are violated and abused. So uh, the question then was to the panelists, what are some of the biggest challenges that children face when accessing justice in the digital age? And what are ways and solutions in which we can overcome them? Um, a very important but a broad question, and I thought maybe Valerie, you might be able to say a few words about um, how uh, how you all are looking at some of these challenges from a UNODC perspective, please. Thank you, Peggy, and thank you for the question. Um, so we already mentioned that we need to be cautious about uh, um, the technology that is developed now. Uh, because we don't know what new justice challenges it will introduce in the future with further development. And when it comes to children, uh, they uh, precisely children have a large uh, digital footprint already at a young age. Their data is collected, uh, shared in uh, many ways with uh, may interfere with their rights. 
So um, the future consequences of the storage and the use of that data are not known at the moment. And uh, this is uh, something that uh, really requires uh, caution. And I would like uh, maybe to, to emphasize one point, which is uh, the situation of child offenders and the online uh, naming and shaming of child offenders with a record that becomes permanent and that is uh, searchable. Also, we have uh, seen uh, child offenders being subjected it's subjected to online abuse and trolling. And uh, this uh, really is a, a, um, a risk for due process, uh, their human dignity, as well as their prospects for rehabilitation. And uh, um, another aspect of the same uh, um, thematic is the facial recognition technology. And the fact that uh, uh, in the past, when a child had committed an offense, there was a process, uh, the child uh, may have received a sanction, but then moved on with their life afterwards. And now um, the, uh, images, uh, reports uh, are being created uh, so that uh, the child's criminal history will uh, uh, or may well follow them for the rest of their lives. Um, otherwise, um, maybe uh, the, uh, I would add that the digital world has added new forms of uh, uh, criminality against children, such as online child sex sexual exploitation, online grooming, and so on. Um, and um, uh, to uh, emulate uh, Triana when uh, she wanted to finish on a positive note, I would say that uh, on the other, other hand, uh, for child witnesses, for instance, uh, there, is a, uh, there has been advantages created, benefits uh, such as uh, providing evidence uh, through video and uh, being able for child witnesses to, to provide evidence in a safe environment. Uh, so this would be on the uh, on the positive one of the positive aspects of uh, digital justice for children. And maybe since I um, emphasize the point uh, uh, and the, the, the adverse impact on children of naming and shaming, um, the the question asks uh, how to overcome um, challenges. Uh, so in that case, uh, the situation can be prevented by law. Uh, to ensure uh, non-publication orders for children at all stages of uh, proceedings. And this is uh, in, uh, in, in agreement or uh, required by the Conve Convention on the Rights of the Child and has been also the object of the uh, comment from the Committee on the Rights of the Child. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you, Valerie. I, I think you gave us a really good insight into, into some of the ways that this plays out with regards to children, both the, the potential concerns and, and problems that we have to be alert for, but also some of the possibilities. So, so thank you for that. Um, we have a, another question that came to us from Mohammed A, who's in Egypt, and wanted to know about uh, the, the current use, really, uh, by Egyptian authorities of digital technologies, where many of these have already been introduced, according to him, and, and the that justice and courts have found that the system tends to impose more restrictions on the work of rights and on the rights of prisoners and on the right to fair trial, um, where the, um, he says that new technologies have been used and imposed violations on political prisoners um, and that the technology was applied under the umbrella of avoiding the risks of COVID-19. So he's, he's asking, so, and this is, is something that our office has commented on in, in a variety of contexts, sort of sometimes under the, the use of COVID-19 as a basis to put in measures that, that might have um, a variety of, of, of bases and may survive beyond the, the COVID-19 related need. Um, so he asks us, what are the best ways to avoid the negative impact of the use of technology on human rights in the Middle East and North Africa specifically? And I know, uh, Triona, that uh, uh, PRA does some work in, in that region, so I thought I'd I'd give you the first shot at and uh, giving us some answers on that question. Thanks, Peggy. Um, yeah, and thanks to Mohammed as well for the question. Uh, I think it's a, a really good reminder of, you know, we talked about this balance of benefit and risk of a lot of these technologies. Um, and this is a really 
you know, how it plays out, I guess, in the most serious terms. Um, it also is a reminder of the increased vulnerability of people in prison, uh, particularly during the pandemic, where, you know, there has been restricted access to many closed institutions. So um, I know some legal aid providers, for example, uh, where it's possible have been um, providing two lawyers. Uh, this comes back to the issue that was mentioned earlier as well, where you know, if the lawyer is in the courtroom um, and the case is being heard virtually um, with the person accused in prison and um, that they don't have communication or maybe that the, the online system isn't functioning well and so they can't um, you know, communicate properly um, or that it, it may not be set up properly. So I think, yeah, in, in practical terms, in terms of like a, immediate responses uh, where legal aid can be provided, um, maybe, you know, doubling up on, on the lawyers provided one in the courtroom and one at the prison. Um, more substantially kind of going forward, I think, you know, it takes a real effort from civil society and from a lot of um, actors at all levels to really support uh, access to prisons, um, even during the pandemic, um, and ensure that when restrictions are on place, uh, you know, with movement between prisons and the community, that that does not include, for example, legal representation, or also uh, prison monitors or any prison monitoring bodies, and that they're supported to continue to do their work in a safe way. Um, and can have access to anyone in prison. And also then that, you know, civil society plays a really key role in a lot of places in documenting any abuses or violations of rights. Um, and that can be really powerful in taking recourse to any mechanisms available at national level, um, whether that's sort of ombudspersons. Uh, we've seen um, findings in other countries where ombudspersons or other mechanisms have found violations of a right to privacy, for example, um, responding to uses of technologies in prisons. So depending on the individual complaints, um, and potentially escalating that to any regional or international mechanisms as well. You know, this meeting is alongside the Human Rights Council, um, and when countries come up for examination, either under the Human Rights Council or any of the UN committees, um, and then I think that's quite an effective, you know, shadow reporting by uh, civil society organizations or other bodies, um, and also, um, you know, reporting and complaints to special procedures under the UN mechanism can be effective as well in raising many of these issues. I think uh, Judge wanted Great. to come Great. in as well. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's helpful. Um, Sarah, uh, I, I directed a question towards each of the, the other three panelists. Um, but don't have one currently for you, but wondered if you wanted to, to just uh, say a, a few words in closing as well. Oh, and I'm sorry, Judge uh, Dragacevic, did, did you want to come in on the question that was just asked? Yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry. Uh, do we have time? It's okay. Just, huh? We're about to run out, but uh, just to be short okay. and we'll, we'll try to close. Quickly. I just wanted to answer to colleague Mohammed from Egypt and that I'm fully aware of sensitivity of his question. And this is very complex issue. It is issue of question of strength of judiciary, integrity of judges, integrity of defending lawyers, constitutional court. And I think that. Unfortunately, uh, Judge Dragatevich is in charge of legality and it's just the fight, you know, and the. In Serbia, the, what the lawyers, defending lawyers need to do, they just go on strike, you know, that it's really big strike that's really somehow close the courts and everything, make it very obvious. There are many ways, and I'm sure as a judge that this COVID situation in many countries that are kind of dictators, whatever, this COVID situation can be misused for the restriction of human rights. That's, that's just the reality. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that additional word on, on that important question. Um, Sarah has, has uh, allowed me to go forward to try to stay on time. So we're going to um, uh, just uh, wrap up the, the discussion now. I think we've heard um, a lot of, of really important uh, inputs about the impact of digital technologies in the administration of justice. I think it would be hard to, to have participated in this discussion without feeling 
um, as I do, uh, particularly motivated that, uh, that we really have no time to lose in, in terms of addressing some of these issues in, a, in an urgent fashion, given their direct uh, relationship to, to some of our most fundamental rights and, and the fact that we've identified a number of concerns around transparency and remedy and discrimination um, and, and other uh, direct relationship to rights where, uh, where we see technologies not just risking potential abuse, but actually having uh, real impacts on human rights now. So I think the concluding question for us is, was to, to look at recommendations for further engagement by United Nations, member states, and civil society on this issue. And we can't get into the details, but I think we've heard a lot of good recommendations from the panelists of some of the, some of the steps that really need to be undertaken going forward and would just uh, encourage all of you to, to pick up these issues, to pick up what we've heard today um, and to bring it forward into the ongoing policy debates in the different venues uh, relevant to this and really try to, to do our best to catch up uh, to the evolving technologies to do human rights impact assessments and to have those impact assessments really uh, influence the, the use and uh, deployment of digital technologies in this space, which is so critical for human rights going forward. Thank you all for participating. Thanks so much to the co-sponsors and to uh, Austria and, uh, and Ambassador Tichy Fisselberger for, for her contributions and to all our wonderful panelists. Thanks very much and look forward to, to seeing all of you soon. Take care. <laughs>